the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today we are talking with Sarah O'Connor, a current tutor with the Law School Toolbox, about setting yourself up to be a mock trial superstar. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess, that's me. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so you can be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the Catapult Conference. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Sarah O'Connor, one of our law school tutors, about setting yourself up for success in your mock trial class and or competition team. So first off, Sarah, can you give us a bit of a background on the type of involvement you've had with mock trial in law school and after you graduated? Sure. So different schools um, set up their mock trial programs differently. But for my school, uh, our mock trial program had the mock trial class be kind of like a feeder program. And so for our school, like other schools with mock trial programs, you had to compete to get into the class. Mm -hmm. And then through class performance, you would make one of several teams um, either during the fall semester and or the spring semester. So I competed on two teams, um, one the second year or my second semester of my second year, first semester of my third year. And then for my last semester of law school, I actually um, co-coached a high school mock trial team as part of uh, me being a competitor my team, I think at least once, became quarterfinalists. My high school team uh, did really well, became district champions and semi-regional champions. And then after law school, I coached three separate teams where the students performed remarkably well. That's a lot of experience with mock trial. <laughs> <laughs> and I forgot, I occasionally co-taught some of the trial advocacy classes. In your free but, time. Yeah, it, yeah, it was it was uh, really wonderful. It was something that I enjoyed back when I was a high school student. And so it was kind of my way of paying forward what I had been gifted when, you know, I had first started my journey. I think that's really interesting. And one thing, especially if a new law student is listening um, to think about is different schools set up a mock trial differently or moot court. Sometimes they call it moot court. There's a lot of different Um, ways this is set up. So at my law school, we had to do what they called moot court, where we did um, mock appellate arguments as part of our legal writing program. And they would still do awards and things like that, but everybody had to participate. And then from there, you could apply to be a member of a competitive team, or you could, um, even at our school level, there was an advocate of the year competition that you could take part in. So there were a lot of different ways that you could get involved. Uh, we then had um, our moot court program was actually student run. So I then had friends who um, were on the moot court board and it was their job to kind of run that whole program. So if If advocacy is something you're really interested in and coaching and mentoring, um, learn more about it in your school because there can be a variety of ways to get involved. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it is um, a little bit typical. It sounds almost like you and I went to the same law schools, although I know it was different. So, Mm -hmm. you know, for those of you guys starting out your first year, it's not too early to find out what you can be looking forward to, usually for your second year of law school, but perhaps even earlier at certain certain law schools. That's true. Our um, moot court program is second semester, um, first year. So it was definitely something you wanted to start thinking about um, that early. And if you're an alum, it can be fun to go back and judge these competitions. Oh, yeah. And a lot of times these competitions, um, if they're part of an academic program, can be even pass fail. And students mm-hmm. will tell me things like, well, it's pass fail, I'm not gonna try. And I love to tell them my story about moot court because I did my argument and then two years later, or I guess it was maybe the fall of the next year, I was um, doing on-campus interviewing for big firm summer associate jobs. And I'm in the elevator with an associate who's taking me to lunch and she's like, I know you, I know I know you, I can't place it. And we kept going back and back and forth and around and we realized she was a judge for my mock tra- <laughs> for my moot court argument. So luckily I didn't blow that off, 
because yep. <laughs> that would have not done anything good for my job prospects. So anytime you do these activities at school, I think especially if alumni are involved, you want to remember that this is kind of laying the groundwork for a little bit of your professional reputation. Absolutely. And in fact, my first year oral argument was how I got my internship with uh, Justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. So I think for you listeners out there, uh, it's it's time to man up and do really well <laughs> at these things because uh, your future may depend uh, in part on how will you perform at these things. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's true. So let's dive in and talk about how to make a trial advocacy team or even um, earn a spot in a mock trial course or trying to uh, win an award in a moot court or a mock trial um, competition. There have got to be a few things that you can do to set yourself up for success. Absolutely. So one of the first things is you want to dress the part that you want to become. Mm -hmm. And so while you don't need a brand spanking new suit for each and every single one of your classes, trust me when I say from sitting on the professor slash coach side of the table, that when you dress for success, you're more likely to obtain it. And um, that's true, even if some of your classmates may snicker, whether from their own nerves or from their own perhaps envy, but consider it like an interview because that's technically what you're doing. You're interviewing either to get into the class or to get onto a team for this semester or next semester. So you want to make, just like in a job interview, you want to make the right first impression. And that's really true. And we've talked about how to dress in other podcasts for interviews and things like that. But just this is one of those times where you want to look like yourself, but you want to look like the cleaned up professional version of yourself. So, yeah. you know, may not be the best time to wear a bright red suit because you probably wouldn't show up in court, at least in appellate court. It's possible you would, but you know, <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily say bright red suit is the way to go. Um, but I also don't think that you should be in something uncomfortable that doesn't work for you. So it always bugs me um, when they tell women they have to wear button-up dress shirts that look like men's dress shirts because those look terrible on me and mm -hmm. they don't lay right on my body. And um, so I always look much better if I'm wearing some sort of like like silk blouse or tank or something under a suit. And um, if I would wear one of these button-up shirts, I would look terrible and I would look uncomfortable because I would constantly worry that buttons would be pulling. I think it's more complicated for women because we have all these different options. Um, you know, but it's you also don't have to wear like super stiletto heels, wear something that's comfortable and easy to stand in. You have to just think about what's going to present an authentic version of yourself, but one that isn't going to have distracting elements. So other things I can caution you about is very flashy jewelry. Maybe not the mm -hmm. right time to pull off an amazing statement necklace. I love a good statement necklace, but maybe not the best time. Um, for men, maybe not the best time to wear a super flashy tie. You know, go ahead and save that for, you know, a family event or something like right. that. But you don't want the clothes to be what they notice about you. You want them to just, you know, be part of your costume to play the part. I used to do a lot of theater and I always felt like when I would dress up to go do one of these competitions in law school that I was just like getting dressed up to play a part. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. And the part is of an attorney or of a witness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think the other thing um, to caution, and I always feel like I sound like my mom, sorry, mom, if you're listening to this, is um, to make sure if you're a woman with long hair, and I'm a woman with long hair, which is why I'm saying this, um, that you make sure that you're not going to play with it. I've, I've heard a lot of criticisms, especially of women who are putting their hair between behind their ears or brushing their bangs out of their face. Um, those kind of nervous habits um, can be very distracting. So you also want to think about how you're going to do your wardrobe to prevent yourself from maybe doing things that can be um, distracting to the judges. Mm-hmm. So now I, I just totally sound like my grandmother. Like, put that hair out of your face. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, a, it's an important point. And for the men out there, so you don't feel alone, um, don't put your hands in your pockets and keep playing with them. That's one of the things that I see for nervous competitors from the male perspective is that's usually their catch-all nerve, nervous telltale sign. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point about men. One more thing about shoes, because women, when I go give talks about how to dress or have in the past, women love to talk about shoes. And let me tell you, I love to talk about shoes too. You could like window in my closet. There are plenty of them. But um, 
you really have to wear something that I'm less worried about it being conservative is you need to feel stable, especially mm-hmm. when you get nervous. You know, if you cannot stand in whatever shoes you're planning to wear with your knees twitching a little bit, <laughs> that's maybe not the best pair of shoes to wear if you're going to stand up and do an or- oral argument. Absolutely. And yeah. and that actually segues really nicely to my next point is that you need to go in prepared. Mm-hmm. Um for whatever is required to try out for a team or for the class. Mm -hmm. And just like with any essay exam, you need to follow the directions. And if you don't follow the directions, you're going to get dinged for it because it's the same um, as not being able to properly follow the rules of the jurisdiction that you're in. And in mock trial class, the, the judge is the professor who has the pass or fail for getting into the class. So make sure whatever is expected for everyone to be trying out for the class. Yes, you want to show who you are and you want to have a unique, distinct presentation. But this is not the time to go into crazy la-la land where you're posing this new um, theory just to seem unique for uniqueness's sake. Right. That's a really great point. And I think what can be challenging about advocacy, which is what I think creates it as a, as a bit of an art, as the daughter of a litigator uh, who watched a lot of trials growing up and uh, appellate arguments. <laughs> but there's that balance where it's planned, but it can't be scripted because right. the nature of advocacy or litigation is that it somewhat has to be off the cuff. And that's a very challenging balance to reach, you know, how can you be comfortable enough with the material that it sounds like it could be scripted, but you're not so tied to a script that you can't pivot when the judge interrupts you and asks you to change direction. And and that is something that professors often will do to see how you handle pressure, because guess what? In a real trial, in the real world, um, your opposition isn't saying, oh, I'm sorry, Sarah. I'm sorry, Lee. Are you ready for me to make an objection? <laughs> That's not what happens in the real world. And so um, that also segues nice to the idea of don't let your nerves get in the way. And trust me when I say um, this is someone who is saying this maybe a little hypocritically because I would sometimes get anxious in mock trial classes or the like. Um, just because we're so used to striving towards perfection Mm -hmm. that it sometimes gets in the way of what naturally flows. You're allowed to take a pregnant pause, to think about a response, to think about um, how what your opposition or what the judge has just asked you will best serve your case. And so it's much better to take a moment instead of filling the silence with ums and errs or something rashly stated without proper reflection. I think that's a really great point. One of the talks I went to, gosh, Allison and I went a few years ago above the law, did a panel in San Francisco with some of the litigators who, or the the appellate lit- litigators who argued um, the California Proposition 8 case at the Supreme Court level. And what was fascinating as they were talking about Um, getting ready for these oral arguments is how they prepare for these Supreme Mm -hmm. Court arguments. I mean, there are lawyers who just basically do those that level of arguments for a living. Um, But it was really interesting to listen about how they sat in these rooms and were peppered with different questions. And these are probably some of the most accomplished advocates in the country. And they Mm -hmm. still had to prepare a lot. And if you listen to the recordings of Supreme Court arguments, they still sometimes get a little tripped up or have to take a pause to think. And these are folks that should have a mastery of what they're doing and should be extremely comfortable. <laughs> I guess if you can yep. be comfortable in that environment, I don't know, but have the best chance of being comfortable environment. And it was very telling to me of this idea that preparation is something that we have to be comfortable with at every point in this type of work that we do. But as a young law student, you should welcome the opportunity to figure out how best to prepare um, because that's not going to go away. I mean, lo- trial lawyers prepare all the time. I mean, that's a huge that's part the of trial work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I, when I was a kid, my dad um, was a prosecutor and did a lot of trials and I didn't understand what trials were. I just meant that he didn't come home and I didn't get to see him right before bed because he was always working so many hours to 
prepped, prepped for trial because it's such an intense experience. And so there's a lot of preparation. So if you're a law student, you're feeling like, well, why is it that I have to practice, practice, practice a lot of this advocacy? Well, it's because it's hard or everyone would do it. And and to that end also, let's let's not be confused as to what arguing your position means. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between arguing and fighting. Yeah. And there is a lot more power to be said by someone who is coolly, calmly, and firmly advocating for a position versus someone who thinks they can get an objection sustained through a loud voice. Interesting. Um, Yeah, one of those works much better than the other. And um, so it's also a matter of understanding what you would want to listen to and what stance you would find most believable. Mm -hmm. Um, This isn't like in the movies where there's this you know, day or moment of reckoning where suddenly everyone praises your your litigation genius. It's it's a building up of elements and arguments. And so I always caution my students, what's the expression? Um, carrying a big stick yet. What is that expression? Oh, do you know the geez. one that I'm talking about, Lee? I do. Um, yeah, oh, pretty, we'll have to look it up. <laughs> yeah, pretty pretty much the idea of a lot more can be said sometimes with what is not said and it's better to to choose your words carefully than to state them loudly i think that's very true it's interesting um that one of the best litigators i've seen um since going to law school was um this patent litigation case out of um it was in the oakland federal courts and it was on dialysis machines. So let's talk about like not sexy, not sexy topic. <laughs> like they were literally fighting over the screen on the dialysis machine. But mm-hmm. oh, it speaks softly and carry a big stick. There we go. Ah, yes. Right. That's Good. what I was trying to say. Yes. Thanks, Lee. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Google. Um, anyway, back to my story. But they, um, they, would fl- they flew in this trial attorney from Texas. And this is in California where, you know, the southern – shtick i guess i don't know the mm-hmm. that like soft spoken kind of charismatic southern persona doesn't necessarily i guess a lot of people wouldn't think it would play well in california but this guy was a master at exactly what you're saying you know he had just this very disarming the accent and persona and he was very calm and he would just kind of explain things so there was no hostility and the jury was mesmerized i was also mesmerized Mm -hmm. i was like this is amazing to listen to him talk about dialysis machines right you know which is bizarre because it was really boring really boring Mm -hmm. and very hard to follow so that was one of the times where i thought wow you know, no wonder they fly this guy in to just do this level of work because he had mastered that persona in the courtroom yep. to get what he wanted and that side won. And I'm sure that that had a big part, you know, p- part in it. Yep. Um, okay. Well, let's see. What can students expect to learn in their mock trial course or their moot court courses in law school? I mean, one of the most obvious things that you should and can learn in your mock trial class are the basic elements of a trial. Um, First and foremost, kind of a little bit of case prep, although some of that is limited in that normally you get a, quote, universe of documents Mm -hmm. or universe of exhibits that you're allowed to work with. Mm -hmm. Um, But you still have to and you will learn how to discern what's relevant, um, what can be used for your position, what can be used against your position, and spoiler alert, you can't ignore what uh, your opposition will use against you, and in fact, if you use it first, that's one of the best things to do to take the fire away from them, Uh is to say, we're not afraid of this, this is how it, you know, this is what this evidence actually means in this case, Um, Other things are openings and closings, so the beginning of the trial, the end of the trial, and then all of that juicy stuff in the middle, the idea of direct examinations of witnesses, cross-examination of witnesses, um, objections that can be raised, frankly, throughout the entire trial, although it's very rare for there to be objections in an opening and closing, though um, it does happen occasionally. 
um, of course, how to act in the in the courtroom, um, including kind of those mannerisms, how to speak that we were talking about earlier, but also how to move in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. um, what you can and can't do uh, when you can and cannot approach witnesses, the judge, um, how close is too close to the jury box is one of those, you know, I guess, geekily spicy topics that people in the mock trial uh, world talk about a little bit. And then really importantly, how to tell your client's story. And let me tell you that even if you're representing a large corporation, you can make that large corporation seem like the neighbor next door by, um, you know, explaining if the facts allow you to do so, that the corporation is comprised of all of the neighbors that live next door. Mm -hmm. and, and so you'll learn how, you know, hopefully your mock trial class will cover both criminal and civil trials and deal with both small plaintiffs and um, and large plaintiffs or small defendants and large defendants. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I hadn't thought about the different kind of defendants and how different those stories are. That's when I started practicing law and I was defending big companies. Uh, I loved listening to the um, senior litigators tell war stories of the language that they would use. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this uh, this one woman, her name was Mary, and she had this like crazy like hairdo bun thing that she always wore. I mean, she was just a, a persona. It's like she had a full fascinating persona, but she had the best stories and she would always say in depositions, and they did a lot of uh, medical device defense, um, toxic torts. I mean, this was not like you... You were not on the warm and fuzzy side of, of the story at this point. Mm -hmm. But she was always talking about how you would, even in a deposition, you'd always be, you know, what was her language to say, I'm so sorry that this has happened to you. You know, as she would talk about all these things that she would say and how she would kind of create a feeling of compassion without admitting anything. And it was fascinating exactly. that there are so many tricks of the trade that um, you can start to compile even in law school and put in your back pocket that you can pull on again. I think for folks who haven't spent a lot of time around the courthouse or courtrooms, you know, sometimes summertime or times where you have some breaks, you never know. You can check the local courthouse in your area or a federal courthouse, or even if you're in a metropolitan area, you might have an appeals court to see if you can go listen to arguments. Because I think watching lawyers do this in person is one of the most fascinating ways to see how this plays out. Um, yep. Because I was even called in for jury duty, like, a, I don't know, maybe six months ago. And if the young DA and PD knew that I was sitting over there, like critiquing, thinking, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest doing that. You know, I was like, <laughs> I'm like, I should mention that to my students. That that's not a wise thing to do. But you know, they did. They were doing their job, and and not to be hypercritical. But this idea of just learning um, what other people were doing, or what questions come off well, or what um, mannerisms kind of. Um, you know, share information with the jury pool or even watching how different members of the jury pool were even um, responding to the different types of questions. Um, yep. You know, if it was kind of a terrible question that the juror became a little bit off put by that, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And you should take every opportunity you can to, especially if you want to be a litigator, to learn about that world. Um, it's, it's a Absolutely. fascinating world. Absolutely. And for some of you who may have um, mock trial happen later in your law school career, like second second year or even third year, um, or even second semester, but you know in your soul this is what you want to do, um, be brave and ask one of the upper class men or women or one of the coaches that you're aware of if you can shadow the team, because trust me, they need warm bodies to play the roles of witnesses or to run openings and closings by. And so that's a great way to start building your reputation as someone who um, has the drive to do it. And you'll have a leg up on some of your other classmates. You know, there's no guarantee that you'd be allowed to do it. But I know that that's something that we did with some of our teams at the at the school, at the uh, teams that I coached. We definitely look to 
first year students to help us out with some of those things. That's really interesting. That's a great idea. We've never thought to just ask if you can help. I mean, what's the worst well, thing to say is no. You know, <laughs> right. it can only go so right. poorly. And then you're in the same spot you were before. <laughs> right. Well, but then okay. you might even get credit for asking because if that person, if that coach is interviewing people for the next year, they at least think you have uh, the guts to come and put yourself in an uncomfortable position to ask. Yep. All right. So you spent two semesters as a member of the mock trial team. So can you just chat a bit about what it was like preparing for the competitions um, and what the competition was actually like? Yeah, sure. So first, when it comes to preparing for the competition, um, let there be no hidden veil of deception. It was a ton of work. Um, And I would wager that this should be or very likely is pretty much universal across any law school's program. Because remember, the point of these law school programs for the competition team is that you're competing to win. You're not just doing this for your health. And so um, even if you maybe find yourself uh, without as much drive as some of your teammates, you better believe that they're going to be looking to and relying upon you. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, I was frankly, for the first semester, in a way, astounded at just how much time it took. And so if you're doing mock trial um, your first semester of second year, you may want to consider how many credits you're taking. Because remember, you're not just going to have mock trial, you're also going to have on-campus interviews. And um, some would argue, myself included, that in some ways, second year courses are more intellectually rigorous than first semester courses. And so I just want those of you who know that this is something that you want to do to not wake up one day and go, oh goodness, my grades are slipping because there's practice three days a week for at least three hours each practice. Mm -hmm. Um, When it comes to the team, generally you get tasks divided to you, um, although I'm sure different teams do these things differently, in that um, one of you will be responsible for the opening, then the other person's responsible for the closing. Depending on the competition, sometimes the closers are supposed to be switchers in that um, for one round they act as one way and for the other they have to switch. So that's another thing to be cognizant of. You know, this isn't uh, marked in stone as set rules for each and every competition. It's just kind of general broad strokes. Um, you know, you have to remain accountable. There's nothing more frustrating than knowing that midterms or finals are right around the bend, as is the competition, and your teammate, for better or worse, hasn't gotten their direct lockdown. Mm. And so you you absolutely have to remain accountable, and sometimes you have to help your teammates out or have you know what can be an uncomfortable conversation about you know you really need to get this together so that we are prepared for competition um practice 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 and the practice doesn't just have to happen when there's team meetings one of the best things that i recommended for my students is to run your opening or your closing by your parents to run your direct or your cross by your significant other. And if they're not in the legal field, sometimes it can be uh, really hilarious and fun because they generally know what they see in shows. Mm -hmm. And so it can sometimes um, help relieve some of that tension or anxiety that started to build for you. And you can realize, okay, I can just talk about this normally Mm -hmm. because if they don't understand what you're saying, you haven't said it right. Um, And I would wager that's the same for, you know, an LRW memo, legal research and writing memo, that um, uh, confusing legalese that we read in some of our earlier tort cases, for example, that's no longer the staple of the legal profession. Mm -hmm. And you need to make sure what you're saying uh, translates across age groups and uh, regardless of whether or not someone has a legal background, because Trust me when I say it will look a lot more favorable when you're presenting in front of a judge. 
Um, you have to be able to handle constructive criticism, particularly if you've got a guest judge coming in. And by guest judge, I generally mean um, an alma mater from your school coming after they've been working a ridiculously long billable day. They've carved out time away from their families, away mm -hmm. from R&R, &R, away from more billable hours. So just be respectful and appreciate that. And you have to prepare for oddball, oddball rulings. So what do I mean by that for those of you guys who don't yet know about mock trial that, that much yet is the idea that there is usually evidence in that universe of facts that I had referenced earlier that you just know is not coming in. Mm -hmm. There is zero ways based on the rules of evidence that, quote, everyone knows. Well, guess what? In yeah. real world, just like in competition, there is occasionally these horror stories of judges who, um, you know, practice maybe criminal law, and this is a civil trial, and they think, oh, just let it in. We'll be a little bit loose. Mm -hmm. And it throws everything off. So you have to prepare for those oddball rulings. Yeah, that's, um, that's really interesting. I also um, liked what you were saying a little bit earlier about criticism and needing to be able to take constructive criticism because I think all law students need to work on this and young lawyers. <laughs> I mean, all of, for all of us, criticism is challenging. You know, I, I'm no different. Everybody yep. um, doesn't like to see negative things written about them or said about them. But um, if you are someone who really has a tendency to respond quickly to criticism, <laughs> that you might want to work on having some coping mechanisms for that, whether it be a few deep breathing exercises while you're listening to the criticism, or if it's um, taking a couple deep breaths before you respond to something. Um, it, it really is a very good skill to practice, probably a lifelong yep. skill <laughs> to practice, yep. because you're going to make mistakes and failure is part of this. But the criticism and the feedback, hopefully it can be constructive, is part of making you better. And um, so if you know about yourself that um, that can hit you quite hard, um, it's important to go in thinking about how you can turn that criticism into something positive, you know, with the growth mindset that we always talk about, but to really circle back and say, okay, that was tough to listen to, but there are nuggets in there that I can really um, think about and, and just make sure you don't accidentally snap at an elder statesman <laughs> because yep. you don't like the feedback. Yep. And, and I mean, remember, guess, guess who the constructive criticism benefits? Mm -hmm. You as the receiver, yeah. not as the person who's giving it. Um, you know, they're not the one who's going to be judged on your performance in a few short weeks. And so, uh, you know, every once in a while, there might be someone who enjoys a few war stories a little too much. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the exception to the rule, not the general rule. Right. I think that's that's a really interesting point. OK, now, how about at competition? Um, what what are some things that you think listeners should kind of understand about the competition? Be cordial. Um, you know, even even when you travel for national competitions, You'd be shocked at when you run into people from your past and you may be shocked as how someone that you met, as Lee was talking about, you know, two years ago, that she may never have thought she would pass across ever again, resurfaces. And so being cordial, even if the uh, opposition isn't, which is rare, um, you take the higher ground. Um, Conversely, if they are the kind of opposition that are trying to flaunt, um, kind of like sometimes what happens when you and your friends are studying for finals, how many hours they've prepared <laughs> or how many drafts of directs they've gone through and all that stuff, don't get psyched out. Usually when people are peacocking, it's because they're nervous right. and just let that fuel your own internal fire and don't rise up to that. Um, remaining calm and professional both before, during, and after the competition are so critical because you don't know in these competition settings, no one wears, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know of any competition where the judges are walking around with a badge that says judge mm -hmm. and um, other people are walking around 
with badges stating jury. Right. Um, I know when I was a coach, because I still looked so young, one of the students tried to hit on me. <laughs> yes. I had to explain to them, um, no, I'm a coach here. Yes, I have students who are working under me. And so remain calm and professional because you don't know. I mean, there are students, um, and I love them. There, there are students who this is going to be their second career. They're mm -hmm. not in their late or even early 20s or 30s. Right. Um, so you don't know who a competitor is. You don't know who's judging you. And you don't know who is going to be acting as the presiding judge. And so they may be sitting in the benches just waiting for whoever's being the, I guess, lead judge to come in before mm -hmm. taking their positions. And you don't want their first impression of you to be you snipping at the competition before things have even started to heat up. That's a really good point. The legal community is a small one. It really is. Yep. <laughs> no matter where um, you live, it really is. Exactly. And then kind of like what I was talking about with the oddball, odd, oddball rulings, I apparently can't say this <laughs> word today, um, is that every once in a while judges mess up. And you just have to roll with, with the rulings. Although one of the tricks can be to respectfully and calmly push back. Um, and so one of the ways can, can be to um, argue it again calmly and professionally or, you know, worst case scenario, say, Your Honor, I would like to reserve my objection on the record mm. because worst case scenario, um, that's what you do in the real world. And uh, when you think, well, this is going to be something we have to appeal. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another way to signal both to the presiding judge and to the jurors that one, you can handle things when they don't go your way. And two, you know how to protect your quote, client in the real life situation where you still stand firm by your position, but realize for better or worse, you're not going to win this one today at the trial court level mm -hmm. and will be willing to take it on appeal. And most, most students don't think that far in advance because we're so focused on the um, dispute that lasts for the two hours worth of the competition. But you have to think of it as if you are in the real world and what you would need to do in the real world to really shine. Yeah. And so how do they judge these competitions? I mean, who are oh, the judges and, and how does it work? Yeah, so it varies by competition again, but generally speaking, um, the judges are um, the people who actually judge you for points are usually not the presiding judge. So I don't want people to get confused when I say judges. I'll try and use presiding judge for the one who's issuing rulings, like on objections and that kind of thing. And the jurors are usually the ones who are or, uh, allocating points. And so I would say nearly universally, there's a certain allotment of points for each component of a trial that we had talked about you learning about. So there's, I don't know, 20 points available for an opening, 30 points for the closing, and each of the directs and crosses are worth 20 or 15 points. And so are objections and motions in limine, which are the things that happen before the openings um, where you want to have the judge rule on evidence before it's heard during the trial. And so the people who uh, are the presiding judge and the jurors who are judges are members of the legal community in the area where you're competing. So um, this once again returns to what Lee and I were talking about, the idea of always put your best foot forward, because although it's rare, it does happen where people can get job offers um, based on someone's impression of how you did during the competition. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they, even if it's a civil trial, that you're competing in, the jurors may be working in an agency ca capacity. They may be clerks for a local judge. They may be a local judge. They could be um, people in the prosecution, the defense, 
or uh, civil litigation or even corporate attorneys. So it's really a hodgepodge. And that's, again, why I mentioned earlier the idea of you need to be able to speak universally, because just like a real life jury who is comprised of numerous different citizens in the community, so is your jury in these competitions. The only difference is everyone there has a JD attached to their name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, The judges look for how well you speak and move in the competition. For better or worse, nervousness can um, subconsciously or expressly factor into how you do. But um, you need to be able to use the evidence well. And that's why planning with your team well in advance. I think normally there's like eight weeks to prepare for these things or six weeks to prepare for these things. That's why it's so crucial to have a team that is willing to buckle in and work hard um, because the judges and jury want to see that you can use the evidence well. Um, Every once in a while, though, because um, these judges don't necessarily practice in the area that the case is about, um, they get it wrong. And sometimes it can be a little frustrating for competitors, my students included, where a um, someone involved in the criminal arena will say, well, why didn't you use this piece of evidence? Well, because it wasn't admissible. <laughs> right. So, you know, that happens sometimes. And you just need to shake it off because, you know, I'd wager that there are numerous attorneys out there who um, have had the benefit of litigating a case to trial where the um, the result that the jury came back with, whether it's the amount of damages or the result, you know, in total was not what they would have expected based on the evidence they were able to present. So you just have to roll with the punches a bit. Yeah. I think the roll with the punches is a great theme from a lot of this, right? <laughs> yep, for sure. For sure. Flexibility. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, because as much as you gripped out in large part the different components of each of the trial, you need to be flexible um, because otherwise you're not listening to what the other side is bringing into evidence. Mm-hmm. And if you just keep practicing as though this is exactly how you would do it, you're not going to be adequately prepared when the opposing side uses evidence in a new way you guys had not prepared for prepared for. And that happens. And that's, that's one of the, um, one of the ways that you can really see trial teams distinguishing themselves from the competition, the ability to listen to what the judge says in responses to objections, um, and how they use what the opposition presents and argues against them. I mean, it's so, it's so embarrassing, but it does happen where a litigant just completely, I don't know, blanks out on whether the judge uh, sustains or overrules an objection and they act as if it never happened. That's Mm. the worst, but it, that's, you know, that's why I think, I think maybe we have an article on this, Lee, the idea of active listening in class lectures, the same applies in a mock trial competition. Mm -hmm. I think that that's really good advice. Well, one final thought for folks who are listening to this going, I don't want to be in court. Like, why would I ever participate in any of these activities? Although you may not want to make advocacy the entirety of your professional job, it is possible that depending on what path your legal career takes, that you will need to show up in court. It could be pro bono litigation. It could be, um, you know, I have a friend who is a family law attorney and she never intended to be in court. She got incredibly, incredibly nervous before any sort of um, moot court or mock trial or anything like that. But now she's a partner in a law firm and needs to, you know, litigate in court. That's part of her job. So she had to, you know, figure it out. And so there's, because the courtroom is such an essential part of what so much of the practice of law is. I think having a basic understanding of what happens in the courtroom, what it feels like to be a litigator in the courtroom, how challenging some of this work is. Um, even if you end up being a transactional lawyer, you know, transactional stuff is oftentimes how we end up in court. So it can still be right. really good to have that understanding. Absolutely. And regardless, 
um, of whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, transactional, litigation, whatnot, you need to be able to deal with the opposition in real time. And mm -hmm. so this is, uh, you know, as scary as it may seem, it's actually a safe space to start testing out those skills. It really yeah. is. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's, it's much better to make mistakes when there's, um, you know, nobody's life or business is on the line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, with that, we're out of time. Thank you, Sarah. That was really fascinating. Uh, yeah, it was great. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review or a rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon.